I will be talking about the outbreak, the biology of the virus, uh, prophylaxis strategies and mitigation strategies. Next slide, please. So this is the scale of the pandemic right now. As you may know, WHO announced this as a, as a pandemic uh, on the 11th of March, uh, 2020. Uh, the numbers that you see up on your screen are from yesterday. The numbers from today are already no, almost 940,000 confirmed infections and over 47,000 deaths in 180 countries. That's the scale of the outbreak that we're talking about across the world. Though the outbreak started in China, but uh, China has stopped any new transmissions. And if you see, at the no see the numbers, you will realize that countries such as US, Italy, and Spain have already gone beyond China in terms of the numbers of infections uh, at this time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the outbreak in India. And again, this is uh, data from yesterday. The data from today is that India has 2014 infections, confirmed cases, 58 deaths. And if you look at the rising curve in India, you will see that the outbreak is doubling roughly every four to five days. So it went from about 800 uh, cases to about 1600 cases in four days from about a thousand cases to about 2000 cases in just three days. Uh, so the outbreak is really picking up and many of us feel that based on the models that have been uh, shown, that the outbreak is likely to peak in India sometime between mid April and mid May. Uh, as you're all aware, there is a lockdown, a 21 day lockdown, uh, which started on 24th of March. And it is important for us to observe this lockdown because what the lockdown is going to do is essentially flatten the curve, uh, the spike in the infections by restricting the circulation of the virus. Next slide, please. On this slide, I address this issue of infectivity versus lethality of infections. And you will see on the graph on the left uh, that this coronavirus has a transmissibility of about 2 to 2.5, uh, which means that every infected person on an average can infect another two or three people. If you compare that to something like measles, which is highly infectious. Measles, one person can give it to about 15 different people. On the other hand, if you look at the lethality, at this time, based on simply case fatality rates, uh, we are seeing a fatality of about three to 4% with coronavirus. This is likely to go down as more people are tested as testing expands also to people who don't have uh, symptoms. But just to compare, if you look at bird flu, for example, bird flu, although very poorly transmissible, had almost a 50% lethality. If you compare other coronaviruses, such as uh, the MERS coronavirus or the SARS coronavirus, they were more lethal. They were, uh, SARS was equally transmissible but it had a 10% lethality. MERS was less transmissible, but had a higher lethality, uh, about 25 to 30% uh, mortality. So this gives you an idea uh, on a scale of how transmissible and how lethal this virus is compared to many other viruses that we have encountered uh, in in the recent past. Uh, as far as comparison to flu is concerned, many people have said that this is just a bad flu. 
uh, it is not a bad flu. It is badder than bad flu. It's worse than bad flu. Uh, if you look at data on the left, that shows you the age distribution uh, data on the right. It shows you the age distribution of mortality in flu compared to COVID. And you will see that while in both the mortality goes up with age, it certainly peaks out in COVID with about 15% people who are in the 80% 80 plus age group uh, dying of this infection, whereas that rate for flu is only under 1%. So while the overall uh, mortality of uh, flu is about 0.02% uh, or at best 0.05%. We are currently looking at a mortality of about three to four percent, but I feel that the real mortality is somewhere in the range of about 0.5 to 0.6 percent, uh, which means that it is still about 10 times as bad as the common flu. Okay, so that is something to understand, to put it into perspective. Next, please. I will tell you about some treatment options. Uh, first, let us see the figure on your right. And you may not be able to see this very clearly uh, because of the size, but I'll, I will walk you through this. This shows the life cycle of the virus. The virus first enters, first binds to cells through a receptor. And that is the first point at which it can be interrupted. So monoclonal antibodies against the spike protein of the virus can interrupt. There is also a protease sitting on the cell surface that clips the spike protein to initiate uh, fusion. If you inhibit that protease, you should be able to inhibit. Later, the virus enters uh, endosomes and these endosomes uh, fuse and release the viral RNA. This endosome fusion process depends upon acidification of the endosomes, which is a step that is inhibited by chloroquine. You would have seen a lot of uh, noise about chloroquine these days, and I will come to that in a minute. Finally, when the RNA is released, the RNA has to be converted into more RNA. That's the replication step. And the replication step is inhibited by replicase inhibitors, which have also been tried with some success. Uh, things like uh, lopinavir and ribonavir. Uh, finally, the virus particles are processed. They are, uh, they are assembled. And here there is a drug called remdesivir, which has been tried, which inhibits this step. So you can see that like any virus, this virus also goes through multiple steps and each step can be a target for uh, therapeutics. Now coming to uh, chloroquine, and the, this is shown in the graph on the left. This is a limited clinical trial that was first done in France, which showed that chloroquine plus azithromycin has the best efficacy compared to just chloroquine alone versus no chloroquine. Uh, and this is really the basis from where everything started for chloroquine. But I would caution you here that this doesn't mean that chloroquine is yet an approved therapy. Chloroquine has been approved by the US FDA as well as the government of India as an experimental therapy to be tried in clinical trials. It also doesn't mean that people can go popping up chloroquine as a preventive. You can do a lot of damage to yourself if you just take chloroquine as a preventive. So I do want to drive home that message that chloroquine is still an experimental therapy to be tried in hospital settings. Next slide, please. I think this slide has become a little distorted. Uh, I don't see the right information on it. Uh, uh, yeah, so just stay on that slide. This is just to convey to you 
don't look at the slide. Let me just, just talk. There are already 40 different vaccine candidates that are in preclinical development. There are two that have moved into phase one trials. The two that have moved into phase one trials, one is uh, a RNA vaccine that has gone into people. Uh, and the second one uh, is, uh, I believe, a replicating vector vaccine that has gone into people in China. The first one in US, the second one in China. There are two other products that are in very late stage of development. And these, uh, one of these, uh, an Indian company called Serum Institute of India is also a partner in developing a live attenuated vaccine in partnership with a US company. So as you can see, very quickly, the world has expanded into developing vaccines uh, for this virus. It's barely a three month old virus. Next slide, please. These are some infographics that uh, our organization has prepared and I'll be very happy to send it to any of you who want this. We have prepared two infographics, this one and one which is coming up next. These have both been translated into multiple Indian languages. And we believe this can be a very useful resource for disseminating information about the virus, various aspects of the virus. So at this you will see how the virus transmits. You will see how to protect yourself through social distancing, avoiding mass gatherings, working from home uh, and all that. Next slide. This is another infographic that we have made, which describes the life cycle of the virus and gives some information on the biology of the virus. I'm not going to describe it, simply uh, indicate to you that it, these infographics are available just for the asking. And these are available in multiple Indian languages uh, for us to be using throughout the country. Next slide. So my key messages. My first key message is please follow government guidelines on uh, quarantine, on the lockdown. It's very, very important that we don't take it lightly. Otherwise, we would have spent 21 days in lockdown and not achieve the results that we are looking at. So it's very, very important that everyone follows these guidelines. Second is that each one of us should behave like an infected person and we should be protecting those around us. And how can you best do that? You can do that best by wearing a mask. Initially, the guidelines said only infected people need to wear a mask, but now the guidelines are everyone should consider themselves infected and wear a mask. So do that to protect everyone around you. The third key message is lockdowns are difficult. We have seen in a country of India's complexities, life lockdown is difficult. So please, those of us who have the luxury of still working and learning from home, please help others who are less fortunate than you. And there are going to be plenty of people in your neighborhood. Please reach out to them by whatever means and help them. And also be aware of the myths that are floating around. And I have listed a couple of myths here. The first myth is that the Indian strain of the virus is a weaker strain. Uh, there is no evidence for this. There are only two sequences from Indian patients that are in the database. And both of these patients acquired the virus in Wuhan, when they were in Wuhan. So how did it suddenly become the Indian strain? It is not the Indian strain. The second is that chloroquine can be taken as a preventive. Absolutely not. Chloroquine is a drug that is only approved for experimental use in clinical trial settings. The third is that since India is endemic for both malaria and tuberculosis, and many of us have taken BCG vaccines as children, we are protected. We are not protected. There is no evidence for this that either past malaria exposure or BCG exposure will protect you from COVID-19. And the final one is that summer temperatures will get rid of this virus. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. 
we don't know it depends on the level of transmission if the virus is very quickly transmitting from human to human it doesn't face the environment for very long and humans have a 37 degree body temperature so think about this don't wait for the summer to come to get rid of this virus you need to get of this vi get rid of this virus and you need to do it now please don't wait for summer okay so that that's my presentation there is no evidence that i have seen <clears throat> that pregnant women are more prone to viral to this virus uh pregnancy is after all an <clears throat> immunocompromised state your immunity is lower during pregnancy than otherwise so you are prone to many other infections there's nothing special about this virus that uh, you know targets you during pregnancy there is only one report that i have seen where it shows that a mother uh, a, a child born to a mother who had covid infection showed antibodies to the virus now it is not clear whether the antibodies were simply maternal antibodies that were transferred to the child or the child self got infected and produced antibodies but that's a single isolated report nothing else well please understand that the 21 day lockdown is not going to magically uh, you know all the virus will magically disappear after 21 days that's yeah. not going to happen what it will simply do if everyone observes the lockdown properly what it will do is reduce the rate of new infections but that remains to be seen whether that will happen or not we will address that in the last week of the lockdown to see if that is happening or not uh so yes even after the lockdown is over please exercise all caution that has been told uh if you don't then you are at a loss yes well data has shown that uh, people who uh die of coronavirus infection usually have other morbidities which and diabetes is one of those morbidities so uh people who have compromised lung function people who have high blood pressure people who have diabetes need to be extra careful 